We have two guests today. I see one of them, and I'm really glad to see you. Welcome back, Harry Osterman. It's great to be back. Dang, man. Good morning, Harry. It's how great long, to be back. How long, have you been on this stage since you became the Alderman? No. no. When I was a uh, state representative, I used to come here. There's a much larger stage. <laughs> um, no, but it's, um, it's great to be back. More tables to sit and More eat More tables, at. I know. And it's a crowded uh, Heartland Cafe, but it's great to be back with you guys. Uh, miss coming up here. Um, but very busy now with my duties as Alderman. So is it, is it, in fact, the dream job that you've been waiting for, like I always thought, saw you doing time in Springfield, just biding your time until that seat became open again? I bided my time for 11 years, but I, I worked very hard, as you know, because yes. I had constituents like you that kept my feet to the fire, and we got some good things done while I was there. But um, being alderman of the 48th Ward is a great honor and uh, keeps me busy every day, 24-7. Uh, Got a great staff. We had a great week last week with a new library opening yeah. at Edgewater. Um, I think we had over 2,500 people come through. It took two years to build. We had a night market on Argyle Street, uh, first in the city. That's it was a phenomenal great idea. Turnout. It rained. A night market. Nice. A night market. They do it around the world, and um, Chicago wanted to expand, and we pushed to get them to do it on Argyle Street, and we had over 500 people. People. A lot of vendors sold out. So, so was was it a Southeast Asian themed? We have no? a lot of great restaurants. Yeah, um, Asian restaurants. So there were a lot of uh, restaurants that had booths, but we had. Um, some um, produce, some farms had uh, some of their produce there. We had a soup guy who sold soup. We had a lot of different things. Um, so It's good when a soup guy sells soup. A soup, soup. guy sold out, and it was great. <laughs> so um, any, on a day like today when it's nice and cold, it's soup weather. But um, I would encourage everyone, it's going to be every Thursday night after the 4th of July. We're not doing it next week, but every Thursday night through September, come on down. It's like a farmer's market with entertainment. Um, we had a, a group that was doing a play. We're going to have some live music. So... Um, it's an exciting time. A lot of good things going on. Well, yeah. Let me throw a question in. Uh, you, you mentioned a uh, number of Asian restaurants. You know, the 48th Ward is just to the south of the 49th Ward. It's sort of all part of our north side turf. And I'm just wondering um, if uh, off the, the most recent census or information you have, if you could give us a description of the ward and maybe some demographics like uh, race, Class, ethnicity, religion, who's moving in, who's moving this out. This is America. We don't measure by class, No, dude. but it's interesting to me to know about how political directions are and what kind of interest groups we might have. I think the reality, both with the 48th and 49th Ward, is that they are incredibly diverse communities. They are, you have a six-unit building and you have different uh, types of people in every unit. And the real beauty of Rogers Park and Edgewater and Uptown is that that's who we are, whether it's walking down the street on Broadway or on Argyle Street or having breakfast at the Heartland Cafe, um, the strength of our neighborhood is the diversity. We have Pride Weekend this weekend and the Pride Parade tomorrow, and I'm going to be marching, and uh, we've got a large gay and lesbian population, um, but there's people from all walks of life. We had the library opening. We had a, uh, a young girl who grew up in Mexico who, who, uh, who spoke. Um, so, I mean, that's part of the heritage of our neighborhood, and I think... Um, that's why people move here and that's why people stay here. So I think that the neighborhoods, I think all along the lakefront are moving in the right direction. We've got challenges like we do the rest of the city. We had an incident last night on Lawrence, uh, a shooting that occurred. So I think violence, especially this time of year, is one of those things that um, uh, brings us together to really make sure our neighborhoods continue to move in the right direction. And um, I think that's something real important for us to focus on. I want to follow up with that because I think the biggest um, challenge to maintaining diversity and uh, economic diversity as well as um, people diversity is uh, affordable housing. And w the trick bag that we're in is, and I love our strip too, from Uptown to Rogers Park, including Edgewater, is a great diverse... Even Old Lakeview, a little south of Uptown. Sure. Um, is, you know, a great claim to fame, independent political history, um, uh, openness to one another and working together, but as things get developed, um, even here in the 49th Ward, which is the last place all the developers discovered. I heard there's a condo. Someone opened up a condo building in Rogers Park. <laughs> <laughs> Using Six thousand. That's good. You could come up here and banter with us anytime, Harry. That's good. Uh, we're losing, uh, I think, the affordable housing unless we m recommit to maintaining. Let me let me 
I, I agree that there needs to be affordable housing for everyone. And I talked earlier about the diversity of the community. Um, whether someone's young or old, they should not be forced out of a community based on the property. I've got senior citizens who invested their lives, made our neighborhoods what they are today. They shouldn't be forced out of the neighborhood because they can't keep up with property taxes or uh, they can't rent a place. So there needs to be affordable housing. But one of the other things that I think is critical is that there needs to be quality housing and the management uh, of those properties needs to do their job. You can't have um, uh, affordable housing or housing for a certain market and the management company does, doesn't do what they're supposed to do. So I think that um, I agree that there needs to be a balance and I think that's something that um, my colleagues and I try to strive for. Um, and I think it's, I, I go back to quality and I think your point about um, strength in the community, a lot of it is housing, but it's also job creation. And when these new businesses come in, they're hiring people from the community. It's about our schools, making sure that the kids in the second, third, fourth generation of people that grew up in Rogers Park and Edgewater and Uptown, that um, they're getting the education that they need to, to strive and, and compete in um, you know, the economy of the future. So schools like Sen High School, which is a school that in the past, um, many people had not wanted to send their kids there, is going to have a record enrollment uh, next year. They've got a great IB program. They've got um, a wonderful fine arts program that's expanding. So um, that school is a school that's really kind of getting back to its heyday, which is going to be exciting for, I think, uh, the communities on the north side. You know, let me just push this a little further, though, because in, in, in discussions about the 49th Ward, uh, we've always uh, kind of prided ourselves that it's probably the... Uh, most diverse place in the country um, and if you take the the whole kind of north side we, we've got a lot of different people from a lot of different places and a lot of uh, people of different nationalities and ethnic groups moving in uh, but I think the ca question of class is something that is not discussed in uh, um, our politics enough and we have a situation where there are a number of people who will move to say Rogers Park because they like the diversity but they don't necessarily like uh, black or Latino, even sometimes white kids hanging on corners. And we have a, uh, a situation where I feel that we, we undermine programs in government that will help poorer people, whether it be the uh, money to the park district or really putting money into the schools. So I want to just raise that with you, um, and I, as I do with many people, that class is still an issue, and a lot of people like diversity, and we talk a lot about diversity, but we don't embrace class diversity. I think, I think a lot of people choose to come to our communities. It, it's a port of entry for people from around the world. In, in, our, in pockets of Edgewater, um, it was the Bosnian refugees, now it's refugees from Africa. And um, there are going to be kids next winter that go through their first winter in Chicago, and we have to get coats for them. Um, <laughs> again, and those kids ultimately could be the valedictorian of their class by the time they're in eighth grade and go on to do great things. Be president. A, a lot of what we be president. Um, a lot of what I'm also finding, though, is that it's about strengthening the family. A lot of those immigrants or refugees or, or people that are uh, on the lower scale on the income level, they don't know what programs are there for them. And it's not necessarily a direct um, program for them. It's, you know, how do you get health care? Um, so this summer what I'm doing, I'm opening, I opened up two satellite offices, taking a page out of my old Morris Avenue days with Katie, um, and we're running a free food program that the city's providing for families. So trying to provide some um, food for the kids that need it when they're not in school in the summertime, but it's also a way to engage their families on what are the things that are going on in their world and how do we help them out? Because the people that, you know, I'm concerned about those seven, eight, nine-year-old kids. If we don't help their families stabilize, they're going to be the ones that are out there, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, getting into the wrong, the wrong end of things. And mm -hmm. I think so. It's about strengthening families and, and helping them uh, help themselves. So I think um, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of building trust. So I think that's kind of um, it's building communities. What it's doing, and it's um, that's kind of what I'm focused on. And um, you know, it, it's 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 hard work, but it's it's in important work and it's important for everyone in the neighborhood because if those families that, that need help are, are stabilized and they they're kind of succeeding um, it's good for everybody
Yeah. What, I'd, I'd like to make just one observation. Uh, I like history and how sometimes radical activities uh, lead to uh, a situation like you just talked about the city providing food for families. I just want to re point out that in the old days, back in the late 60s, early 70s, the Black Panther Party started serving breakfast to children. And that kind of, that kind of activity, I think, you know, at a later level, manifests itself in more mainstream kind of politics. Just sharing that. Thank you, Michael. Good. When does this I thing always, happen? I always get great history about you know <laughs> Chicago coming on this show. Yeah, so. you think you're being interviewed? It, it's a whole nother thing here. It's an education. It's just a conversation with reminiscences by Michael, which are good reminiscences. Well, thank you very much. If only I could say the word. Um, you brought up uh, in what you said, Harry Osterman, Alderman Harry Osterman, 48th Ward, um, something that. Uh, touched on two of the many heavy-duty issues that we're facing right now, uh, both immigration and education. Um, now, I know the, that some of the members of the Sen High School community staged their reaction, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago to the school closures. Um, and we've got uh, a statement that came out this week from the Progressive Reform Caucus of your body, the City Council. Um, basically being appalled at uh, the school mess, I'll call it. Um, the um, basically being appalled at the stripping away of basic necessities for education, like arts, sports, uh, museum trips, toilet paper. There, yeah. Um, I. What I'm wondering is why that statement wasn't signed by every single city council member. What, what is it about, why is it just the quote-unquote progressive reform One of the two progressive causes. So I'm working with a group of my colleagues on a, the Paul Douglas Alliance. I think that the reality is, is that um, the, the caucus of group, you remember, I don't know that they emailed or asked the other people, they, they kind of put the statement out. So, uh -huh. um, but let me say this, I think that um, it's important that we have good schools in every every neighborhood in the city of Chicago, and it, and the future of the city is is based on that. We also have the reality of a financial situation with the schools and with government in general that is it cannot be ignored. And I think that um, getting uh, Chicago public schools on sound financial footing um, required some school closures. Um, there are some schools where um, the enrollment has gone, had gone down a great deal. And I think that led to it. Um, in a perfect world, those schools are filled um, and they're, they're thriving. Um, the reality though is now we're at a point where those schools have now closed and it's inherent on all of us to make sure that um, this summer with safety and the start of school and the quality of education is better than where uh, than it was before for those new kids. And there are schools on the north side that were affected by those closures. and. Um, I'm going to work with my principals that are going to be receiving kids from those schools to make sure the transition and their families that it, that goes smoothly. Um, but I think we have to try to look for other ways to help with, you know, education funding. And this goes to the bigger issue of pensions and things that the, the state's tackling. Um, the state is not tackling. Well, okay, let's be clear. <laughs> the the things that the state's tackling. Hey, the, you know, the reason we are the way we are is the state hasn't tackled these problems. For what? Our 20 years. Let him talk, Katie. I'm right, sorry. Um, <laughs> there are some significant issues that if we don't deal with in the next six months, year, are going to cripple us for a long, long time. And not just on the schools, but on property taxes and a lot of things. It's going to... So I think that... Um, the General Assembly and the Governor have a lot of work to do. Um, and, you know. So I'm sitting here shaking my head, Harry. I mean, <laughs> really, we've watched Springfield in its uh, paralysis. I mean, I, you know. I, Let me throw this in. Cause, okay, cause, the, 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 the. Um, okay, throw it in, Michael. Well, I understand that we have some financial crunches. And I think probably on a state level, there could be ways that. Uh, uh, 
the taxing structure changes, the property tax structure will change a little bit, and I don't think they've gone there yet. But what I'm really, I got two things. Are you really comfortable with the closing of the schools? And I'm not comfortable with all the closure of the schools. I think that there are schools that, quite frankly, whether it's because of the administration and or because of the, the lack of enrollment. If there's a classroom with 10, 15 kids and there's a school that's down the block that that consolidation makes sense, I think that that should happen. All, sure. Closing all those schools in one fell swoop, not something that I'm supportive of. Could they have done it in, in waves? Sure. But I think um, it was an action the school board took, CPS took, and now we have to kind of make sure that it works to the benefit of the kids and make sure that the start of the school year um, is one that is beneficial to those kids and their families. Those schools are going to get additional resources, um, so it's going to be one of those things that, you know, whether it's on the north side or whether it's around the city, I'm going to go in, into those schools and see how it, how it is working, how it's being implemented to see that it's beneficial. Let me just ask one more thing on that note. Um, where, I mean, there's a lot of cuts that are, are just aimed at unions, at teachers, at schools, at various facilities uh, across the board and around the country. Where in the city council have you guys taken, some guy, men and women, taken steps to uh, assure or maybe to put a little more strain on wealthier people? and on the corporate entities. It seems like we're like our Supreme Court these days sort of leans business. It seems like we have a mayor with the support of some of the council that tends to lean toward big business and I'm just throwing that well, out Let me you. say this, I think that in the last two and a half years the city council and the mayor have worked together to keep the city's financial house and put it in order. So reducing um, some of the departments, making efficiencies, consolidating departments where it made sense to make sure that we're stable for the future and we're not going to try to raise property taxes for basic services like, like garbage. We did the grid the grid -based garbage which made sense it wasn't sure. on ward boundaries it was on you know how to do it um, so I think that the city we tried to work to make sure that we're on more si financial sound footing for the future but let me say this on the pension issue we need the help of the state because um, there are some things that are going to kick in in the next year and a half that if we don't deal with they're going to have a huge effect beyond the savings that we have put in place kick in like what few things that are going to kick in. Um, payments that are going to be due to the fire and police pensions uh, based on a statute that was passed to kind of um, jumpstart um, payment to those so that make sure that they're solvent in the future. Uh, and that's going to be something that has to get dealt with very, very soon. Wow. And depending on how that's dealt with, you're pitting teachers against firemen and policemen. I mean, it, <laughs> I, I just wonder uh, how we get it. So this conversation, you know, you just said we're working together with the mayor to make a more solvent and sensible financial situation for the city. It would be great for people to know about those. It would be great for the communities to be on board ahead of time. And I know you do a good job of talking with your community. Often our Alderman has the same claim to make, um, but not always, and not always do um, city citizens who care, like us, like a lot of our neighbors, um, have the information they need with, in our explosive information age about our own local situation, tax-wise, money-wise program, to, say, to make sense of it. And maybe there is no sense to be made. Maybe in your job now as alderman, you've been you've been a community organizer as the head of the environment uh, Edgewater, Edgewater Community Council. Council for what ten or eleven years. You did that, and then you were in the state for ten or eleven years. Springfield, poor baby. And he's still a young guy. And yeah, still just a young so guy. Just so you know, you are listening to the life of the Heartland Mike show, James. and uh, <laughs> a little more. And uh, just so you know, you are listening to the live from the Heartland Show. I'm you Michael James. I'm with Katie Hogan, and we're talking to our friend Harry Osterman, who is, who the, is alderman. the alderman of the 48th Ward, uh, right just south of where we're sitting today. 
Well, I mean, first, it, yeah, so... Uh, so I guess, the, you know, we are going to start this summer the city's budget for next year. And, and I think through that budget process, it's important that constituents know what's on the table. I like to keep my constituents informed. I would ask everyone to sign up to my um, website for email. We do a weekly newsletter. It's 48thward.org. You can sign up and you'll get an email blast and a lot of great things going on in the 48th Ward. But during the budget process or if there's a policy decision like the parking meter, um, which I voted against uh, the recent uh, change um, you know I like to keep people informed yeah because you know whether it's good news or bad news you know they're my constituents and they should know what's going on and in a democracy that's always a really good idea right? let me ask a question about uh, the elected school board situation now we don't have that while the rest of the state tends to and there are I've heard great arguments from both sides on the issue and as you know our alderman was going to help bring it to the floor uh, but didn't and that that has in probably been a little spark that has encouraged more people laying the groundwork for a move to have an elected school board. Um, I tend to on the democratic front uh, kind of root for that sort of thing. On the other hand I know that sometimes uh, a vote can go in a, in a different direction. People I'm just wondering where you're uh, at on this or if you have a position yet. I think that I think that going to a strictly elected school board right out of the box, I've seen how elections can be um, manipulated. manipulated <laughs> Your word, but um, where influence um, that funds elections can slay it one way or the other. And That's I think right. that I don't think anyone wants to see that where it's just a, it's a money race for an elected school board. Doing some kind of a hybrid where it's uh, partial election, partial appointment, I think is something that uh, I'd be open to. But I think part of it is we have, I think, some time to look at what might be good models and what, mm -hmm. what has been done around the country um, to get where there's a little bit more, there's more democracy and uh, people feel like their voices are being heard, which I think is in something that's very, very important. So um, I'm open to those ideas and it's something that constituents of mine have talked about. And um, I think, you know, I'm going to try to see what ways we can explore that. Well, so in the thank you for that. Um, in the uh, course of the last few years, uh, e uh, neighborhood community budgeting processes have uh, come into play. And um, are you interested in uh, engaging with that in the 48th ward? That's a really good question and one I'd love to answer. So um, given that Joe Moore, Alderman Moore, has done the participatory budgeting, uh, he's done a great job with bringing people into the process. Yeah, yes. And that's been something I've been resistant to do. And, and basically because I have spent the money that has been, we're, each Alderman gets 1.3 menu, menu to put towards things. I basically put it towards resurfacing our community. And if you drive through the 48th Ward, um, I think you're going to see that there's not a lot of potholes. Yeah, when you drive into the 49th, you about fall in a hole. <laughs> there's there's a great deal of uh, and the 40th. There's a great deal of um, so we put the money in the into the yeah. ground, and one of the issues I had is that to run that process is somewhat expensive, but. Um, I also look at it a different way. I'm very responsive to my constituents. People call me and say, Harry, you know what? Our street needs to get resurfaced. We resurface the street. We need our new lighting. You know, we're putting $800,000 in brand new lighting that's going to be up this summer in an area that we've got crime. It's going to make it a little bit safer uh, for people walking down the street. So, um, but we're also working on, um, we, we're doing a master plan for the 48th Ward, which has a lot of community input. We're going to put it out there on some bigger infrastructure items. Them. So um, I like to put the money into resurfacing, but with with you know, and if people think that we're doing the right thing, they're going to let me know. And if they're not, uh, like residents in the 49th ward, they're very communicative about things they don't like. So, um, but we've been putting the money into resurfacing and re that sounds good. The uh, let a thousand flowers bloom, as Mao said. We can have participatory Katie, budgeting Mao here on the, the on the, the radio too. Of Mao <laughs> All in one swell foop. Um, speaking of vision and building a plan, I I read in your website uh, that Rahm Emanuel's strategic vision vision for the city included this uh, look at the park and extending the bike path, and um, you get to now wrestle with that animal, which is pretty pretty. Uh, high tension item for us up here on the lakefront who still have the lakefront available to us. And you have the added issue of the high rises who think the lakefront is theirs, <laughs> not wanting a bike path 
between them and their beach. Um, very similar to the people that live east of Sheridan Road in Rogers Park. Exactly. Um, so let me, I mean, there's a couple of issues with that, and that would be a plan that extend the bike path from Ardmore to Thorndale. Um, one of the challenges for me is I've had community meetings you know, to be out there talking to the residents, and a lot of the residents in the high rises bring up some very valid points about um, a couple things. One of them is, on a, well, on a day like today when it's sunny and 85 like it should be, um, people flock to the beach. It's a right. beach named after my mom. And um, young families, people, having people that are riding bikes, you know, zip and pass, there, there are, are conflicts there that could lead to people getting injured. Um, the other thing that I'm very sensitive to is the cost. And the cost of doing this right now is estimated somewhere on the $4 million mark. Um, so I'm trying to think through, you know, the cost of it and how we pay for it, and all that money's not secure. So um, I think that is something that also weighs on my mind when we look at, you know, are we going to build a four million dollar bike okay. path that's going to go one block? So or, or are we going to hire, you know, forty art teachers across the city? Um, but the key thing is that, you know. Um, I want to make sure that people can cycle through our neighborhood safely and that residents who live in the high rise, and this is a big issue that's, you know, a solely uh, uh, 48th Ward mostly, is that we have a lot of people that get injured with cyclists that come down Sheridan Road on the sidewalk. So yeah. um, people are supposed to ride on Kenmore Winthrop. A lot more cyclists are doing that, but we have to make sure that it's uniform. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be increasing the, the penalties uh, for riding bikes on Sheridan Road on the sidewalk. Take note. Take note, everyone in Rogers Park and Evanston, ride on Kenmore and Winthrop. I like the way you say, I'm going to be raising the fees. Well, like, on site, I know, you know it's accurate. It's his call. It's, it's, I know a it's, six, accurate. it's a, it's a six-block window. We've got a bike path that's no, on Kenmore and Winthrop. And it's, I couldn't be it, more supportive. If it wasn't an issue, um, I wouldn't do it, but it's an important issue for my constituents. And, and we're trying to really make it where um, it's easier for cyclists to get through. So... No, adults, adults yeah. who ride on the sidewalks, I'm I say, ask the last it's question called a here. sidewalk. I'm going to ask the final question of this segment. And, no, you're uh, not. At the same time, well, okay, Katie, you'll ask one after I do. That's right. Uh, and I, but I would like to... You could always invite me back. ...encourage you. Yeah. To that's what yeah. I was going to say. We'd like to have you on a more regular basis because you are a, a friend and we do appreciate a lot of what you do. Well, and now, also On that note, let me ask you, uh, as, a, as a young politician who is growing in the job, um, the question I have is uh, kind of in your own thoughts about it, when do you, uh, what, do you have to take a position that's kind of politically expedient or you, know, you have to temper your, your true heart's desire around things and those questions of real conscience that come up. And how, have you had to experience that yet? I've dealt with that in Springfield. I voted against an income tax increase because I felt it was going to hurt small business and, and hurt people. Um, I voted against the parking meter deal recently because I didn't think that the numbers made sense uh, for our community. Um, so I think I've taken those stances. Um, and the reality is, is that I'm very grounded in I know who got me elected, and that is the people that live in my community. And um, the people that walk down the streets, the people that, are, you know, that live there, and they expect me to do what I think is the right thing to do. That's been my guiding principle. And, um, and I'm going to stick to that. And I think that um, I, I try to do the best I can to make the you know, best votes I can and advocate for things that I care about. I love my community, and that's something that, that keeps me um, focused on the job. There's a lot of progress in the 48th Ward. We're very focused this summer on the violence and making sure that um, we bring the violence down. And, and we're focused on it like a laser because it undercuts everything else that's good that's going on in our communities, whether it's Rogers Park, Uptown, Edgewater. So um, we're focused on that. And uh, Well, Michael was right. He got to ask the last question. Um, thank you so much. Everything you just said is part of the reason why you're a great public servant, Harry. Um, but stay independent. <laughs> Please stay independent. If and I ever waver from my independence, I'll, I'll find my way back to the heartland. And, well, we're uh, going to come find you, too. Next, next time, <laughs> next, we, we know where you are. Next time, we're going to talk about firehouses, because uh, you have a unique situation from us. You're going you're gonna to get what we want from our firehouse, which is a community center, whereas right on the website, DNA, it said, 
we're going for the dollars for the Greenleaf Firehouse, whereas they're going for the quality and maintaining this landmark. If there are any art status. centers out there that want to go into a firehouse, call my office, 784 5277. We take people from the next ward. We take people from all over the city. So we have a firehouse we want to have build into a community center, and there's an RFP that's out now, and we welcome people to look at it. And um, it, otherwise, if people want to open up businesses or move to our neighborhood, it's a great neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, but sign up for our website, 48thward.org, and you'll get the newsletter and see the good things that are going on. Mary Osterman, thanks a lot. Have it's a great weekend. Happy Stay Pride warm. Weekend. Yeah. Yes. See you in the parade. Uh, you're listening to Live from the Heartland Show. I'm Michael James. I'm here with my co-host Katie Hogan, and uh, we're going to take a Glad short musical break. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit of the, the Cuban band Mescla, who are in town playing at the Old Town School tonight. And uh